Hello, this is Jana, and welcome to Story Nori. And I'm here with Matthew and Elaine Sweetapple, the creators of Lost on Infinity by Rockford's Rock Opera. It's the musical story of a dog called Rockford who journeys to the island of infinity, home to the last one of every extinct animal species. We've had a sample of these wonderful stories on our website for many years, and they've been tremendously popular. Matthew, thank you so much for dropping in. Can you tell me what you've learnt over the years? Well, we've learnt lots of things, but I suppose I think the most important is how wonderful it is to be in a position to be able to write stories for children all over the world and to hear what all those children think of those stories and how, in many cases, really pleased to say, our stories have inspired children to look at nature and also a love of music and storytelling. And I can't think of a, a better thing to do than to inspire young minds. Wonderful. So what about the science behind the story? Very important in our story is the fact that every creature, every plant, has a secret for the world, whatever that might be. In the scientific world, that's called biomimicry, but really that's just a long word for learning from nature and seeing how nature has worked out how to address problems and to make things better. And Elaine has an excellent example of this mm -hmm. because she, in our story, plays a character called the Cockleburr Ick. Yes, well, although the Cockleburr Ick is a fictional character... It's based around true science because many years ago, back in the 1930s, a Swiss scientist called George Lemesra was walking his dog in the Swiss Alps and when he got back he noticed there were little cockleburs stuck to his fur. And as he was picking them out he decided to look at them under a microscope and what he discovered, the cockleburs had little hooks on them and these hooks would stick to the dog's fur and eventually after a lot of trial and error, this Swiss scientist developed Velcro, which is now being used all over the world for lots of different reasons. You probably have Velcro straps on your shoes, and it's even been used by NASA. So a fantastic invention was discovered just through observing nature. Just another example is that LED lights, so the lights that we nearly all use now, they're now 90% better and more efficient and more bright because scientists have studied the way that fireflies make light. Fireflies, which we don't see in the UK, but other people listen to this may know fireflies, create natural bioluminescent light and they do this very very efficiently it's very very bright and scientists have studied the way that uh, fireflies make light and they've as a result made led lights 90 percent more efficient so they use loads le less electricity so it's good for the environment but it's just another example of learning from nature and doing things better and doing things in such a way that is better for our environment because nature always works out really clever ways of doing things which live in harmony with the planet and that's what we all need to do and there are so many wonderful and inspiring ideas out there and that's something which is very much part of our stories amazing matthew um now you've launched a new podcast that's right yes so our story lost on infinity is now part of our podcast which is called stories science and secrets and what that does is it tells the story of Lost on Infinity about Rockford going to the island of extinct animals. But also after the story, we talk about all these amazing inventions that we're learning from the natural world. So it's a very positive and hopeful view of the world at the moment, which I think is very important for children and also very inspiring. We're going to listen to the first episode of Lost on Infinity. So Elaine, can you give us a quick introduction? Well, it all starts in a, a little town in London called Battersea. And we meet a boy called Moog and his dog, Rockford. And they go off to the park. And that's where the adventure begins. In a block of flats in Battersea in London, England, lived a boy called Moog, his mother, and a dog called Rockford. Battersea is famous for three things. Its park, where Rockford liked to go for walks, the power station, whose four great chimneys can be seen for miles and miles, and Battersea Dog's home, where Moog had picked Rockford out earlier that year. But as this is just the start of this adventure, and I can hear the orchestra tuning up, we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. There is, after all, an amazing story to tell. Every day, watching as the world goes by in my room. Crazy days, waiting as the world runs dry of good news. But then they keep the glorious sound of little 
Rockford the dog was brown with a crooked tail. At first he hadn't been sure of Moog, his new owner. The family who had owned him before had got bored with him, and for a while Rockford hadn't trusted any humans. But he was fine now. Moog loved him, and so did Moog's mother. However, in a small flat, on a long winter's afternoon, a boy and a dog can get just a little bit in the way. So when an uncle comes to visit, then it's a good idea to get him to take the boy and the dog to the park, to run about and get exercise. So that's exactly what happened this winter's afternoon in Battersea. Moog liked his uncle. He had taken him to the Natural History Museum the day before, and they had looked at the dinosaurs together. They had bought a model of a T-Rex you could build out of cardboard and spent the evening making it. It was quite difficult, and in fact, when it was finished, it looked more like a crocodile trying to peer over a fence. But Moog put it on his shelf all the same. It's amazing to think creatures like that once roam the earth, he said. I'm not sure creatures exactly like that ever did, said his mother. But I know what you mean. Now, as they got ready to go out into the cold, Moog and his uncle were looking forward to roaming with Rockford in a wintry Battersea Park. Make sure you take care of Rockford, said Moog's mother. He likes to run off. Of course I will, said the uncle, winking at Moog and grabbing a football in Rockford's lead. Come on, you two, let's go. As they walked together towards the park, the sky was darkening to a deep blue. To the west, the winter sun was tangerine orange and sinking down below the rooftops along Battersea Park Road. And to the east, the great grey chimneys of Battersea Power Station pointed up towards the stars that were just beginning to shine. Battersea Park was full of people, and as soon as his lead was released, Rockford ran off happily. He loved the park, and so did Moog, and when they were together, life felt better. Moog and his uncle were now kicking the football to each other, shouting bits of commentary as they did. But suddenly, when they looked round to check where Rockford was, to their alarm, he wasn't. This wasn't too serious because Rockford often ran off chasing after an interesting smell or another dog, so they assumed he'd soon reappear from behind a bush or round a fence. But he didn't. Moog's uncle's heart sank. This was exactly what he'd been told not to do. Oh no, where is he? We must find him, he said. He was over there, said Moog. Towards the lake. Rockford, That's exactly where Rockford was. He had found a tree near the lake, which was one of his favourite places for doing what dogs do by trees. The tree had a blue carrier bag caught in its bare winter branches. It was too high for anyone to reach and had been there for ages, snapping in the wind like a flag. It meant Rockford could always remember that tree, and he thought it was special. Because when he did what dogs do by trees, the humans would always scoop it up in bags and put it carefully into strange-looking black boxes by the side of the path. Must be important, thought Rockford. Maybe it's magic. Rockford pointed his bottom down at the ground below the tree. But something wasn't right. Something felt odd. Then he heard what sounded like a squeak, so he stood up again. Please be careful, I'm only small, said a voice that sounded as if it was coming from his bottom. Rockford craned his head right round and began walking in a circle, trying to catch his bottom up, but he could never quite manage it. And he couldn't quite see the small, sticky yellow creature with a rough green stripe down its back that was now attached to him, although he could hear it complaining that it was now stuck to his backside. Oh dear, I really do need to get off, said the animal, its little yellow legs waving helplessly in the air. As Rockford walked round and round trying to see whatever it was, he began to feel dizzy. He was aware of moving closer to the side of the lake, but it was only when he felt the feel of the ground change under his paws that he stopped and looked round. There was water on every side. He was standing on what seemed to be a gigantic leaf with its edges curled round like the sides of a boat, and with a large, leafy sail, and he was now drifting out into the lake. He could hear his name being called from somewhere behind. He wanted to run back to Moog, but the shore was now quite far away. What on 
earth is happening? said the little yellow creature, who was obviously just as confused as Rockford. Rockford didn't have a clue who this stranger attached to him was, and the little animal was certainly now well and truly stuck. But then, as if to read his mind, the small sticky creature stared up from Rockford's bottom and said, We're stuck because I am a cocklebur ick. And as the leaf boat drifted further out into the dusky lake, and with Moog's worried cries echoing further away, the cocklebur ick told Rockford its story. There were once many cockleburr icks. We were sticky, not pretty or quick. Cause people are twits. They didn't want cockleburr icks. For our fur was all sticky and thick. And we cried in the night in the street. He seemed kind and his smiles were all sweet Some people aren't twits Perhaps the, the cockleburr inks cockleburr. He'll see beauty is more than skin deep So why not come play for a bit? Said the man to the cockleburr inks cockleburr. With your fur that will stick quick Come to my house and we'll sit. We'll have tea and jam, raisins and sweets. So along went the Cockleburr And they sang as they danced down the street. This man wasn't friendly a bit Cause people were twits He captured the cockleburr icks Used their fur for fastening his bits Cause the coat of the cockleburr ick Was cheaper than buttons and zips so the tale of the Cockleburr Ick Cockleburr Is a tale that'll make you feel sick Cause people are twits You'll, You'll never see Cockleburr Icks Cockleburr In the fields or the parks or the streets Cockleburr The poor little Cockleburr Icks Cockleburr All undone Cause of fur that would stick Cockleburr and cause people are twins. What a sad story, thought Rockford. Although he knew people could be strange, all the humans he'd met recently had been very kind, and certainly not twits. But he didn't have long to wonder, because a mysterious warm breeze had now caught the leafy sail, pushing them along faster and faster. The other side of the lake was nowhere to be seen, and the water on which the little boat bobbed had become a wide blue ocean with an extraordinary coloured sky swirling and fizzing above them. And so on and on they travelled, to who knew where? Rockford the dog, and a small, sticky, cockleburr ick. And that was the first episode of Lost on Infinity by Rockford's Rock Opera. You can hear some more episodes on Story Nori's website, but also you can catch the podcast, Stories, Science and Secrets, in your favourite podcast app. There you can learn the science and secrets behind the story. 
and I'd like to thank Matthew and Elaine Sweetapple for dropping by to see us. We really enjoyed meeting you both. For now, from me, Jana, at storynori.com. See you soon.